Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله تعالى حق الجهاد حتى اتاه اليقين صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وازواجه وذريته واهل بيته وصحابته الكرام ومن سار على منهاجهم ودعا بدعوتهم الى يوم الدين اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله Indeed, all praises are for Allah, the mighty and the sublime, the most high and the exalted, alone without partner. We know this and we believe this, and we practice this, and translate this into physical deeds. We praise Allah, the mighty and the most high with our tongues. We worship Him in everything that we do, in every act of manifestation of this ibadah, this worship of Allah Azza wa the greatest of which is praising Allah and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When one of the companions came to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, complaining, seeking guidance, and asking for help, he said, Inna sharai al islami khad kathurat alayya. That there are many rules, many injunctions, many do's and don'ts. I can't grasp all of them. My mind is more simple and basic. So give me something, tell me something that's easy and comprehensive that I can hold fast to. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله. He says, always keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon your tongue. Always remember Allah the Mighty and the Most High. And the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us, كَلِمَتَانِ He says, two statements that are easy and simple for one to say, that are heavy and weighty in the scales of good deeds, and our beloved to our Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al -azim. It takes you literally two seconds, if that, to say it. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, He loves those statements. And the most beloved speech to Allah Azza wa Jalla is when a slave praises Him and lauds Him and mentions His beauty and His perfection. We ask Allah the Mighty and Most High for help, for assistance. We ask Him for pardon, for forgiveness, and to be kind to us and be merciful to us and not to treat us how we actually deserve to be treated. We ask Allah Azza wa to be better than what we are to Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to treat us like we should be treated, but we ask Allah the Mighty and the Most High for that hadith to be applicated 
and implemented upon us when Allah created the creation and He wrote down what He wrote down and that book in which those things were written down was with Allah Azzawajal فوق Arsh, above the throne all of the creation and it said in that scripture إِنَّ رَحْمَتِي سَبَقَتْ غَضَبِي He says that my mercy out stretches my mercy it extends it supersedes my anger and Allah's anger in the Rabbaka, Allah he tells us, Hana Shadidul Iqab is severe in his punishment. But Allah's mercy is greater, the mighty, the mighty and the most high. And that's why we say, Bismillah Rahman and Rahim. In the name of Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. And you may say these words are synonymous, they're the same. Ar Rahman and Rahim. Merciful and merciful. But that's not the case. And some people they say in English, the most merciful, the grantor of mercy. Some people they say the beneficent. The merciful. And the scholars of Islam, they differ on what do these two names actually mean. And what are the differences between Rahman and Rahim? Because they come from the same root word. Rahamim, Rahima. Some of the ulama, they say Rahman all of the time. In every situation, in every instance, in every scenario, with everyone, Allah is Rahman. But they say Rahim is a specific time, a specific place. A specific servant. Rahman to all of the human beings. Rahim only to the believers. Rahman in this life. And Rahim only in the hereafter. I.e. Allah the mighty and the most high was always merciful. Is always merciful and will always be merciful. And his Rahmah that is specific and more exclusive is shown at a specific time. When Allah tells us this prophet, this messenger, we showed him mercy. We gave him mercy. We were merciful. The Prophet tells us that Allah will be merciful on the day of judgment. And Allah is already merciful. But Allah is just wrath, His anger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala putting His maqt and His ghadab and His la'an is only temporary. And it's only from time to time and from place to place. Allah is not always angry. He's not always showing wrath. The wrath will come, it will go, but Allah's mercy is constant. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's mercy is greater than his anger. Allah's rahmah, his kindness, is more than his, his severeness. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this to be implemented upon us. And for Allah to treat us in a way that we actually really don't deserve to be treated. Because if Allah took us to judgment, and if Allah Azzawajal treated us according to our statements and our actions, we wouldn't be standing here today. No one would be standing here today. We ask Allah to protect us from the evils of our souls. And from the consequences of our sins and our mistakes. Those who are guided is because Allah has made them so. And those who are misguided is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them so. I bear witness and I testify that Allah along with our partner is the one who deserves to be worshipped. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam along with our partner deserves to be followed. May his name be mentioned in the company of the chief angels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with his wives, our mothers. Aisha, Um Salama, Zainab, this one, Maymun, all of the Sahabiyat, his wives, his daughters, and all of the females from the believers. And may Allah Azza be pleased with his children, and his grandchildren, and his Ahlul Bayt, the believers and the Muslims from among them, those who are righteous and pious, and his companions, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Umar al-Farooq, and Uthman ibn Affan, the Nurain, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu al jamia and the rest of the companions that were promised paradise, and Bilal radiallahu anhu, and all of the noble and honorable companions and disciples of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, to proceed. The best speech is the speech of Allah, the mighty and the most high. And the best guidance is the guidance of the Messenger of Allah, the authentic sunnah. The best guidance is the sunnah of Abi Dawood. The best guidance is the Muslim of Imam Ahmed. The best guidance is the Sahih of Imam Muslim. The best guidance is the Muwatta of Malik. That's the best way to live. Through the hadith of the Prophet And the worst way to live is by shutting those books, closing those books, and allowing those books to collect dust, to collect cobwebs and spiderwebs, and living by what this one says, and what this one thinks, and what this one interprets, and understands, and practices, and makes up. And the shaitan creeps up on this individual. He creeps up on someone that has a good intention. He creeps up on someone that may have some type of piety and righteousness. But the moment you become far removed from knowledge and far removed from the statements of the Messenger of Allah and how he lived, indeed the shaitan will lay an attack upon you. 
as we've witnessed in the history of the Muslims. From the misguided sects, those who have strayed from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger are the Sufis. But if you read the, histories of the, the history of the Sufis and how they started off and how they began and how they evolved, it wasn't always bid'ah, it wasn't shirk and kufr, it wasn't ilhad, it wasn't distortion. They were sick and tired of the worldly life and of the dunya and its filth and its defilement and the two-faced people, the politicians, the people of wealth. So they removed themselves from these circles and from these gatherings and from these congregations. But they also became far from ilm. And they went a bit too far into kashuf and asceticism and seeking to divorce the pleasures of this dunya. And lo and behold, the shaitan, he crept up upon them. And it became what it became to this day. So the best way to live is according to Muhammad. And the worst way to live is according to other than Muhammad For every single innovation is misguidance. أما بعد يا عباد الله فقد أخرج الإمام أبو عبد الله البخاري رحمه الله في جامع صحيح قائلا حدثنا حجاج بن منهال قال حدثنا همام عن قتادة قال حدثنا أنس رضي الله تعالى عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يضحي بكبشين أملحين أقرنين ويضع رجله على صفحتهما ويذبحهما بيده والحديث أخرجه الإمام مسلم Anas رضي الله عنه was narrated that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام كان يضحي بكبشين أملحين أقرنين The Messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام he used to slaughter every year he would slaughter he would offer a sacrifice and the sacrifice that Muhammad offered wasn't a camel, nor was it a cow. He says, Kabshaini, Amlahaini, Akranain. He slaughtered two sheep. Two sheep. Amlahain. They weren't white sheep, nor were they black sheep, but they were mixed. Like Oreo, or like a calico cat. A tuxedo cat, you say. As another narration says, Yang Burufi Sawadin. He says, bring me two sheep, bring me two goat. He says, They look through black, black patches around the eye. And when they kneel down, it's upon black. And when they walk, it's upon black. A mixed color sheep. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would take these two animals. And he would gently place them upon the ground. And he would place his foot on their side, on their flank. And he would slaughter them himself. He wouldn't delegate his companions he himself would get dirty, quote-unquote. He himself would allow the blood to be upon his hands and his clothes. He himself would physically teach the companions how to slaughter and how to offer the sacrifice. And Anas radiallahu anhu, he says, Kana, this is, what, this is what he used to do. And the Messenger of Allah, has never been quoted or narrated that he didn't do the sacrifice. And this is the reason why some of the ulama of Islam, they say, Offering the sacrifice, making the udhiyya is obligatory. Some of them, they hold the view that it's mandatory and it's unnecessary for a person who has the ability, who has the finances, to leave off offering the sacrifice. As Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَانْحَرْ إِنَّ شَانِيَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرِ Allah says, indeed, O Muhammad, we will give you the kawthar. We will grant you this splendid river. So pray to Allah Azza wa Jal one har lahu. Offer the mandatory prayer, as Abdullah bin Abbas said, one har yani nusuk. He says that what's meant by this verse that we all memorize from Juzamma is to offer the udhiya, to offer the sacrificial animal. Inna shani akahu al abtar, the one who hates you, the one who despises you, the one who belittles you and mocks you, he will be cut off, he'll be severed from all good and from all mercy. Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us, Qul inna salati. Say, O Muhammad, my prayer, wa nusuki, wa mahyaya, wa mamati, lillahi rabbil alameen, la sharika lahu, wa bidhalika umirtu, wa ana awlul muslimin. Tell the people that my prayer and my sacrifice, my life and my death, don't belong to me. They aren't for me, but they're for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My prayer and my nusuk, as Sa'id ibn Jubayr said, the udhiyah, or all of the acts of ibadah. How I live and how I die is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbil Alameen. La sharika lahu. No partner for him. No second, no third. Wa bi umirtu. And the highlighting point, Allah says, and I have been ordered with this. 
وَعَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And I'm the very first Muslim. I'm the first person to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. I don't preach what I don't practice. I don't tell the people something and then avoid it myself. I'm the first person to make sujood. I'm the first person to make this act of ibadah that I tell the people to do. So the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to go and tell the people that he is to offer a sacrifice for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for his sake. And as the narrations tell us, the Prophet ﷺ, when he offered the sacrifice, he would mention Allah's name. He would say, Bismillah. And he would say, Allahu Akbar. He wouldn't offer the sacrifice in the name of a deity other than Allah Azawajal. In the name of a saint or a forefather or an ancestor or a spirit or an angel or a demon. But he would only sacrifice and slaughter for Allah the Mighty and the Most High. And this is the divine connection between Muhammad's practice of sacrificial slaughter, between Hajj and between the way of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim, who is considered to be the leader of the monotheists, He's the forefather of the people of a Tawheed. Allah Azza He tells us regarding Ibrahim, "Qad kanat lakum uswatun hasanatun fi Ibrahim wa ladina ma'ahu." Allah says, "Indeed, and in Abraham and those who are with him, you have a fine example. You have a good example." Thumma uhayna ilayka an itabi minna ta Ibrahim hanifa. And then we gave you, O Muhammad, to follow the way of Ibrahim, and this is a way of pure, sincere Tawheed of Allah, the Mighty and the Most High. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he was the imam of the muwahideen. And yet and still, despite the fact that he was the forerunner of tawheed and sacrifice and the pilgrimage, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he also said, as Allah explains to us, وَجُنُبَنِي وَبَنِيَ أَنْ نَعْبُدُ الْأَصْنَامِ رَبِّ إِنَّهُنَّ أَضْلَلْنَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ He said, O oh my Lord, O oh Allah, اُجْنُبْنِي, protect me. وَبَنِيَّ And my children from idol worship. And Ibrahim والسلام, was the one who smashed the idols. He was the one who broke the idols. He was the one who was thrown into the fire because of the idols. He's the one who lied because of the idols. He's the one who tricked them because of the idols. And he asked Allah to keep him safe from idol worship because shirk and his filth and his sediment and his defilement has led or misled many people. Ibrahim Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala he said regarding this ayah, وَمَنْ يَأْمِنُ الْبَلَاءَ بَعْدَ الْخَلِيلِ عَلَيْهِ السلام. He says, who can be safe from shirk and the fear of shirk after Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا And Allah took Ibrahim as a close companion, an intimate friend, and he still was afraid of shirk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told Muhammad to revive and to quote-unquote resurrect the abandoned practices of Ismail, who was the learner, and the student of his father, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And that is why the Arabs offered sacrifice. That's why they slaughtered animals. But they did it in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they did it for other reasons and for other purposes. As far as this ummah, this nation, then we are commanded to sacrifice for Allah and only for Allah subhanahu azza wa jal. Alhamdulillah, wa kafa, wa salatullahi, wa salamuhu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa, amma ba'd. From the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, as that which is well known, is that he yearned for something, he longed for something, he was heartbroken, and he was distraught for many years out of his life. One narration says, 80 years out of his life, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, and when Allah azza wa jal finally granted him that wish, and gave him what he wanted, Allah asked him for something. And he requested and demanded for him to give back and to repay that favor. And that was the sacrifice of his son, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. So just stop and think about this now. You wait so many years to have a child. You go to the doctor. You get checked out. You go to the physician. Is it me? Is it my wife? Am I sick? Am I ill? How much money is spent? People that go to sorcerers and magicians to find out why someone can't have a child. And then after all of those years, you're old and weak and your bones are thin. Allah Azza wa He blesses you with a son, a baby boy. And then Allah tells you to slaughter that baby boy. Who from among us could do this? Who from among us would have the will and the power and the control over self to implement this? Your son. When it comes to the basic rules of Islam, you can't even implement. You can't tell your son to do the right thing. 
You can't tell your daughter to do the right thing. You can't enforce Islam upon your own children. Physically, verbally. You can't even tell them to ittaqillah, get rid of that son, that's no good. Don't go here, don't bring it to some house. We don't have the ability to do basic things with our children, let alone take their lives to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Ibrahim alayhi salam, that is exactly what he did. And he put him up upon his side or his back, and he took out that sharp blade, and he placed it upon him, ready to take his life. And then Allah Azawajal says, Qad sadaqat al He says, indeed, you have interpreted the dream correctly. And Allah Azawajal, he says, you don't have to slaughter him. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah says, and we ransomed Ismail with a huge ram. We ransomed him with a very large animal. Meaning, instead of your son, now slaughter this animal for my sake. And that is the foundation of Uthiyah. That is why we sacrifice these animals during this time. Because Ibrahim salam, he did it, and it was symbolic. Just like Ibrahim salam, in his story with Hajar, and where they went with Ismail, and to the desert. Allah says in a, a valley, in which there's no vegetation, no herbage whatsoever. I've placed my family in the wasteland for your sake. And Hajar and Ismail and Ibrahim, Allah tells us this in the Quran and in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about how they established the Hajj and the Zamzam and the Safa and the Marwa and stone in the Jamarat, etc. So there's a connection between Hajj, there's a connection between Udhiyah, and it's all wrapped up by the Tawheed of Allah, the Mighty and the Most High. And not like the ignorant fools who say that the people are coming around in Kaaba because it's a pagan worship or uh, the deity of the moon. These people don't know Islam. They don't know Arabic and they haven't read the books of history. This is why we do these things. Let them worship the Lord of this house. And it never says, Let them worship this house. So this is why we sacrifice and why we slaughter. However, the Prophet he didn't allow us to slaughter anything. He didn't give permission to slaughter anything in any way, in any time. And the only animals that are lawful to be offered as udhiyah are one of three classes. Goat and sheep, cows and bulls, and camels. Behemoth al-anam. You can't slap, sacrifice or slaughter a turkey, no matter how fat it may be. You can't offer a turkey, or fowl, or chicken, or pheasant. No matter how much you like this type of offering, or large fish. It has to be one of these three animals. As Allah Azawajal tells us once more about his khaleel, فَمَا لَبِثَ أَنْ جَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ حَنِيذٍ فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ حَنِيذٍ Allah says, and when his guests entered upon him, he gave them the salams, he was unaware of them, he didn't recognize them, he didn't know who they were, they were the malaika, the angels, and then he went back to his wife, and he brought them a roasted calf. One ayah says, بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينَ A fat calf. And another ayah says, be ijl and hanif, a roasted calf. Just as we go to the Yemeni restaurants today, and you say, hanif, the meal that you enjoy at the Yemeni cafe, is mentioned in the Quran, it was roasted. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, there's no contradiction in the Quran. The calf was fat, and it was also roasted. And he offered that to his guests. So this is why we slaughter these animals. And the animal must be healthy. It cannot be sickly. It cannot be excessively lean. It cannot have a clipped ear or trimmed ear. It cannot have a missing horn or half of the horn missing. It cannot be diseased and manged. It has to have the ability to run, to jump, to hop, and to keep up with the rest of the flock. It has to be meaty and fatty, and it should be meaty and fatty. And that's the purpose of my khutbah right now. Weeks before the Eid and weeks before the pilgrims go into Hajj. And that is because when you go to third world countries, people that are utterly poor. If you've never left the United States, if you've never lived overseas, then I would honestly say you don't really know poverty. You think that you've seen poverty in the ghetto. You think that you've seen poverty, poverty in the rural places in the south or other parts of the country area. But you've never seen real, true poverty until you go to a third world country. And you see people drinking water, washing up, washing their dishes out of one plastic bowl. You see people sleeping, eating, entertaining their guests on one bed, on one sofa. And then you really know poverty. But despite these people being this poor and not having material possessions, you find them the most generous and the most honest and the most welcoming people with regards to their guests. And they will put their money together. 
They'll go under their mattresses. They'll go in the backyard. They'll take their savings out of the metal coffee tin can just to make a good entertainment for you as the guest. And from that which these poor Muslims do is they save up for their sacrificial animal. Not now, but a week ago or two weeks ago or maybe two or three months ago, everyone in the village or the family, they start chipping in to buy a lamb, to buy a goat. Not like us, we go to the farm, give me this one, let me pick out that one, how much is this one, how much money will you charge me for my aqiqah? Nah, it's not like that. They pick out the animal and they take the animal to their homes and they feed the animal. They feed it and they allow it to graze in the backyard or in the roof or in the basement or whatever their living conditions may be. And they take care of the animal and they build a bond and a relationship with the animal until it becomes fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And after all of that kindness and good benevolent treatment and money that they sacrificed and saved up, then they take its life. They place a razor sharp blade against this soft tender neck and the blood spills and spurts out. And then they eat from it and they give it a sadaqah and they hand it out to the poor people and the orphans and the widows in the village. So this is the concept of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. He didn't just bring a lamb or goat or sheep, but Allah says samin, it was fat. In other words, offer the best to Allah, the mighty and the most high. Don't be cheap. Don't be miserly. Don't cheat yourself. When you slaughter the animal and sacrifice the animal, try to make it the best one that you can, inshallah ta'ala. Instead of the food that you buy, or the clothes, or the other things that you waste your money upon, offer an ajil samin, and be upon the way of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, and make sure that the animal is of the proper age. It cannot be too young. Camels have a specific age. Bulls and cow have a specific age. Goat and sheep have a specific age. It is in my duty. It is in my job. Nor is it my intention to mention the details and the specifics of this in this brief khutbah. The only thing that I want to do is remind and enlighten. Educate and refresh. Bi'idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah to make our Eid one that is happy and blessed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place us upon the way of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Our true forefather and our true ancestor. We ask Allah the mighty and most high to allow us to let go of the wealth that we cling and clutch to. To spin upon the cause of Allah, the mighty and the most high. Wa akhir da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen.